What do crew members do during dry dock? Depending on what department you work in, you may have the luxury or unfortunate circumstance if your ship goes to dry dock. Now what is dry dock? Dry dock is when uh, a cruise ship needs some upgrades or uh, some work done. They want to revamp something and so they take it to a special place where they actually raise the ship out of water. Um, and then depending on what work needs to be done, they can work on the engines, they can work on the inside, they can repaint the vessel, they can work on the propellers and the ozipods. Um, it just depends and you know, some crew members happen to be on the ship during a contract when a dry dock is scheduled. They don't send everybody home. Uh, so you still live on the ship during dry dock and it's a completely different experience uh, than the normal cruise run with passengers and your normal job duties. My very first contract on my very sh first ship, the Norwegian Star, um, about halfway through my contract, we had to do, or we were scheduled to do a dry dock. Um, and it was strange because I had never done a contract anyway. And so I was jumping, you know, there were people who worked for the company for 15 years who'd never done a dry dock. And this was my third month in. Um, so it was definitely something new, not just for me. Where we went, we went from our run at that time for those first three months was from Los Angeles down the west coast of Mexico. We went to Cabo, St. Lucas, Mazatlan. Um, and then we went up to Portland, Oregon to do our two week dry dock. And for me as an American, it was quite well. When I got off the ship, it was it was fun. I never been to Portland, Oregon. So I did enjoy seeing um, the cool places, you know, going out in an American city, you know, and, and having fun. Uh, the thing about cruise ships, at least cruise ships that are ported in American ports, uh, the cruise line holds your passport. So what happened was no one was given their passport. So when they got off the vessel in Portland, non-Americans only had their ship ID, basically. And in Portland, Oregon, there are very strict uh, regulations and laws about drinking and stuff um, and proper ID. So those IDs weren't good enough to allow most people to go into bars and stuff to, to buy out. People of age couldn't buy alcohol. So it was, it could have been a lot more enjoyable for certain people. Unfortunately, the rules of the ship dictate all these things. So, you know, hope, you know, if you're walking down the street, hopefully you find a place that might let you in or, or if you're looking for someone to drink, a place might not card you, but Portland's pretty, pretty strict about their regular about their uh, drinking rules so for the most part it wasn't as fun for most people the Norwegian star in dry dock had to do several different things they were working on the Oz they were uh, working on the exterior I believe they painted some they were working on the ozipods so a ship old ships like the Titanic they had propellers that stuck out straight in the in the bow or not the bow um, in the stern and then they had rudders that would move left and right and so the water from the non-moving uh, stationary propeller spinning it would kind of push water either way and then the ship would turn. Modern ships have ozopods and what ozopods are are basically separate engines that kind of stick out below the ship that can swivel 360 degrees and then they have a, a propeller on the back of them, and so the ozopods actually turn, and that's what steers the vessel. And that's what majority of the Norwegian cruise line, if not all the ships, and most of the cruise lines are using. Um, so they, they were working on those, maybe changing a propeller out on one of the ozopods. Um, in, on the interior, Norwegian had just started a, um, like a deal with Jimmy Buffett with Margaritaville, so they, they revamped one of the bars on the ship and turned it to a Margaritaville. Um, our photo gallery for the photo department was was old looking with old carpet and all they had was they would just print all the photos they would take and then put them in the little slots and there was really no rhyme or reason. It was always crowded in there and so what they did is they gutted the entire photo department and then they built it bright shiny white with digital displays and so 
passengers could swipe their, their cabin card and their photos with their IDs would pop right up and it was really advanced and really, really cool and all digital and, and cool like that. Uh, they painted some stuff and a lot of, in the buffets and a lot of the uh, restaurants, they, they redid some upholstery, um, they, they rebuilt some fixtures and in the broadcast center, we gutted the broadcast center and switched over from analog broadcast signal to digital, all right? And so they, they had already replaced all the televisions years prior, so the, but you know most televisions can accept analog or digital signal. Um, and so the, we didn't have to change any TVs or anything, but we did have to go through every single stateroom, over a thousand rooms, and reprogram the televisions um, to accept digital. And actually, we had to do that twice. I'll get into that later. Um, some of the crew did leave. Not everyone. See, the thing is, they bring like a thousand contractors from all over the world with specific, you know, welders and painters and carpenters and all these people they bring from all over the world. Um, and a lot of them don't speak English at all. You know, they just bring them hire a big, a big company who specializes in this kind of stuff and they bring them on board um, and then they live on the ship in the staterooms, right? And then they go to work every day and it was two weeks, seven days a week, nonstop, okay? And so as a, as a crew member, there wasn't much we did, but we were still getting paid and so what the company has to do is they have to find something for you to do. In the entertainment department, my department, the majority of what was, do, was being done by crew members was called Firewatch, all right? And that's basically the managers created shifts for different um, crew members in the entertainment department in different uh, places where they're welding and stuff to just stand there with a fire hydrant, or not a fire hydrant, a fire extinguisher ready in case there was a fire. And for hours, you just stand there and they put on a, a suit with goggles and they stood there. I didn't do that because I was dealing with the whole broadcast situation. Um, but Firewatch was a big deal. The entertainers, musicians, singers, dancers, all the band members and all the lounge bands, they actually, NCL flew them back home, which didn't make sense to me actually because some of the bands were from Jamaica. And I think there was a drummer from Australia. And I was just like, how much money did the cruise line spend to send these people home and then fly them back two weeks. I don't think they paid them for those two weeks that they were gone, but they paid for the ticket home and back. Um, so I guess they came out on top, you know. I mean, the money they spent on the dry dock was astronomically high anyway, so I don't know. All I know is I didn't get to leave. Um, but uh, in broadcasting, it was a different situation. We had, we had uh, three or four um, engineers come on and to help us install new hardware. Uh, we ripped out some old cabling. We, we uh, redid some of our computers um, and we installed new software and a lot of our equipment ready to broadcast in digital. The cool thing about that experience for me was I was still learning. You know, I'd only been on the ship for three years. I just started working on cruise ships. When I got hired, I didn't know that much about broadcasting anyway. So what I took away from it was I learned the old analog system, an older way of, of broadcasting, at least on cruise ships. And then, after the dry dock was finished, I learned an entire new system, an upgraded digital system. So I learned twice as many things as the people before me or the people after me. Plus, my partner and I, because we were the broadcast technicians on the ship while dry dock was going on, we were in the office speaking with the engineers and we were helping them design how the workflow should go, um, which was kind of cool, you know, because we, we actually had a say in how things were integrated and how things were put together to best benefit not just my partner and I, but to best benefit every bracket session down the road. And so one thing we had to think about was, you know, our, the engineers would ask us, you know, what what things do you need? You know, what is your normal cruising? We said, well, our normal cruising is this, but we're going to Europe. And in Europe, they add channels and they change languages and they do all these different 
they have different rules and stuff. So we, we kind of had to know a lot more about what was going on. And so it was kind of a struggle at some times, but for the most part, it was, it was pretty, pretty cool to, to really have a say in, um, in what exactly was going on in, in our office. Unfortunately, a lot of shoreside managers in all the departments came to Portland um, because a, a lot of the management, shoreside management is based in Miami, so they just flew to Portland, Oregon, um, and they were with us. And so my shoreside manager, who I really enjoyed, um, uh, her as my manager, but because she was there, a lot of times these shoreside managers, you know, they they try to put you to work. You know, they 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 don't want to see you sitting around and doing nothing, kind of thing. Um, and so, like a lot of times, my partner and I were in the office, you know. And sometimes we were helpful, but a lot of times we weren't. And so we were just like, why do we have to be here? Like, obviously, I'd rather get off the ship and explore Portland. And so, uh, my partner and I didn't actually get to get off the ship as much as some other people. Um, other departments, aside from entertainment, though, I felt had a little bit worse of a, an experience. People in, like, the restaurant department had to, like, scrape paint, clean, you know, like, scrub down stuff. I mean, some of these really grunt, grunt duties, you know, and uh, and a lot of those in the restaurant, their salaries are, are kind of lower, at least in the entertainment department. Some are not, but some are, and, and I felt bad. I was like, you know, they're, they're a, lot of, a lot of these people make tips, you know, in the restaurant, and uh, it was unfortunate that they were doing these really hard physical jobs, like scraping paint and stuff, and getting paid their minimal salary with no opportunity to make tips. You know, the, that's unfortunate, you know. Um, so I was, the entertainment department was a much better, I, in my opinion, a much better place to be during something as hard as dry dock, even though I didn't get to get off a ship as much. Now, we also had concessionaires. Um, people in like for instance uh, the people who work in the spa so the spa isn't actually owned by NCL it's a separate company on the on Norwegian it was called Steiner was the company that the spa um, is and then uh, so all the people who work in the spa actually work for Steiner and it's almost like they're they're at, like third party people who work on the sh they just happen to be on the ship you know um, but all their money is made from passengers because NCL doesn't pay them. They make money from Steiner. And most of, this, most of those kind of positions are based on sales and commission. And for those two weeks in Portland, they weren't making any sales. You know, So you, know, you take a six-month contract and you take away two weeks' pay, you're not, you know, that's, it might hurt some people. You know? But they, because they didn't work for NCL, they didn't do anything. They had no responsibility. And for the most part, they got off the ship all day, every day. If anyone was American, it was probably better, you know, but because uh, they didn't have their passports, but they didn't have to worry about anything. So I guess it made up it made up for not getting paid. They didn't have to do anything, you know, so they could explore a little bit more. They could rent a car, you know, I guess if they could and and drive further away from Portland, you know, maybe go up to Seattle or something, stuff like that. So so then the two weeks go by. And it's been a long two weeks. I mean, they, they turned off the air conditioner. And if you've never been on a cruise ship, it's mostly cycled air. They turned off the AC. And within, I was laying on my bed when they did this. And I remember within a minute, I was sweating from head to toe. Just, I could see the sweat bead from my body. It was, it was horrendous. Now, one thing they did, um, because no passengers are there, they moved the crew bar from the fourth deck in the little nook that it was in, up to the pool deck, you know. There were rumors that they were going to keep the pool full and leave the hot tubs open and, and the crew was going to chill. Uh, they drained the pool the minute we got to Portland. I mean, or the, they, I think they drained the pool the minute we left Los Angeles to come to Portland. Like, there was no chance of anybody swimming. Um, they, they did leave one hot tub open. And I don't know if they did that on purpose. It was kind of hidden, so... Maybe they, maybe that was on purpose, maybe not, but I used it when I could, so that's okay. At least we had one place. Um, but the two weeks, it was a long, long two weeks. I would, it was not fun. It was not, it was, Portland was cool, but it was just not, my job on the ship was way less stressful. 
way less work, way less dirty, way less physical. I mean, it was it was a struggle. But after the dry dock, during that first cruise, after dry dock, something happened. We all discovered that the contractors who were working on the Ozipods had installed one of them upside down. How does that happen? I have no idea. But they did. And if the ship would, would rev that Ozipod propeller too much, it would burn out. It would it would uh it would it was it would it was it would break. It's it didn't work. And in a, in the next month we actually were were we were gonna cross the Panama Canal from LA to Miami and then from Miami we were gonna do a transatlantic to Europe and they said the ship won't make it to Europe if we don't fix this Ozipod. So what they had to do was a an emergency second dry dock. Where? The Bahamas, which is on the other side of Mexico. So what we did is they actually had to cancel a two-week Panama Canal cruise. Panama Canal cruises are big cruises, long, lots of passengers, booked well in advance, big deal cruises, and they had to cancel it, give people back their money, a huge fiasco. And then the ship went from Los Angeles with just pa- or just crew members all the way through the Panama Canal, all the way to Freeport, the Bahamas. That was, I don't know, it was like an eight day, <laughs> maybe not eight days. It was a long cruise with just crew members to go from LA to the Bahamas, lots of days. Uh, and because we'd already had dry dock two weeks before, there wasn't really much else crew members could do, at least not until we got to Freeport Um, Because a lot of stuff was already done. So this situation changed everything. This, uh, the second dry dock became more of the fun dry dock. Um, Because it was in the Bahamas, a lot of man, a lot of shoreside managers did not come. So there wasn't that, you know, looming higher authority get to work. It was kind of like, you know, we're kind of hanging out. Um, a lot of work was already done, so we didn't have to do, there was no more paint to scrape. You know, there, our broadcast center was done, revamped, ready to go. Photo center was finished. So while we were in the Bahamas, we didn't have to do as much work. All right. Um, and I think that the the ship realized this. So on the, you know, they realized, you know, Crew members did a lot to work. There's nothing we can make them do. And, and the mistake wasn't on the crew members. It wasn't on, on any of us. It was on the contractors, you know, for this, sec- this emergency dry dock for the next time. So, so they actually gave us a handful of uh, crew parties up on the pool deck. You know, we could wear flip-flops. We're not usually allowed to do. We could wear shorts. We could drink outside. I mean, this, they still drain the pool. They didn't let us use the pool. But, you know, you can't, you can't have everything. But it was a lot more relaxed that second time. Um, and then in the Bahamas, we could go out every... We had a curfew, but we could go out every single day and every single night. And we did. We would take taxis, and we, were, uh, and we would drive into town, and we'd go to the beach, and we'd go, to the, we'd go shopping, and um, we'd go to these beach tiki bars and, and have a great, great time, you know? Um, it wasn't the best part of Freeport, um, but it was, it was cool, you know? Um, now, the thing about that, though... I'm telling you about like the concessionaires, like the girls in the or the the workers in the spa. They had two weeks in Portland not getting paid, and then they had a two week cruise plus dry dock again not getting paid with no passengers. So the concessionaires who make commissions went an entire month without making any money. So a six month contract cuts down to working for six months I guess not working but you're getting paid for five months I mean they had an entire month with they're not getting paid I mean I thought that was absolutely crazy um I was still getting paid I got my full salary you know so I was I was I was fine 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 you know um but yeah we'd go off and, and it was a good time um but there were definitely things about it that were that struggled you know and there's there's a chance if you work on cruise ships 
there's a chance you won't ever do a dry dock, you know? And so I think, I think there was somebody I worked with who had done two or, or it was their third dry dock or something crazy, you know? I thought it was funny that within my first contract, I did two dry docks, you know? Um, but uh, that's just me. Um, it was an experience. <sighs> After that first two weeks in Portland, though, I think I told somebody, if I said, you know, for my second or third uh, ship my if you know I, whenever I was offered a new contract I I said if I um I'm gonna I'm gonna ask if this ship in the next however my my contract is I'm gonna ask if this ship is scheduled for dry dock and if it were I'd say I'm not gonna do it it was that first two weeks was very not pleasant um to say the least and I didn't even have it the worst than some people um so it was just, it was, you know, some, some crew members think cruise life is hard when it's going good. And then you get to dry dock and you're just like, man, oh man, what am I doing? You know? So it was, uh, I'm happy to talk about it because not a lot of people have ever done one and, and it's a different experience for everybody. And uh, it can be brutal or the, if you do two in a row and the first one is miserable, the second one might be incredibly fun and the second one was way more fun than the first one uh definitely so um chase those contracts and uh try and uh get on a ship that has a dry dock scheduled um because maybe you have even more fun stories than i do